A very good morning to all of you. And let me first of all thank the President, thank Freddie, and thank all of you for inviting me here this morning. But the mystery remains. Why am I invited to a printer's, org to a printer's summit? And the first, when I received this invitation, I asked my secretary, why do you think they're inviting me to a printer summit to speak? And she said, I think, ma'am, because you give too many printing orders from the colleges. <laughs> well, that was her sense. But when I met Freddie and I met the president, I said, you know, it will be my privilege, indeed my privilege, to uh, speak to such an august audience like yourselves, who have created a beautiful world for all of us. Because if I didn't have the prints in front of me, if I didn't have uh, you know, those be beautiful pictures in front of me, I don't think half my life would have been as successful as this. And I must say that every time we went abroad, we used to collect brochures from the universities. And all those universities have now said, Everything's on the website. Everything's on the website. But I think it'll never take away the charm of having a printout in your hand and actually relaxing and seeing it and reading it. Uh, and I think I will never give up on the print industry ever. <laughs> but it's interesting to see how when I was uh, leaving, yesterday, uh, late evening when I was leaving, uh, I had this young students with me, and one of the students, uh, I said, you know what, tomorrow I'm speaking at the printer's summit. And that young, the others felt, okay, it's okay, but this young boy tells me, um, printer's summit, please tell them a message from me. He's an 18-year-old, all right? And he tells me, please tell them a message. Tell them that, that next time I want my question paper in 3D printing, and that all my letters that I write to my girlfriend should be in is invisible photo ink so that my parents cannot read those letters. <laughs> well, the 18-year-old is giving you a strong message, right? That this industry is transient. You have to move and you have to change. You have to go from 2D to 3D. You have to go into photo ink uh, invisible photo ink, and, and all this, which I didn't know myself. How do these young people know even the latest in what's happening in the printing? So this is a bigger challenge for us, because the challenge is that I have to make my education as transient and as modern as possible for them to be able to match all their businesses and, and do the new things they are doing. So. I just wanted to say that, how did I first of all get into the teaching profession? Because I was doing my master's at the Sydenham College, and I'm sure there must be, over the years that I've taught at Sydenham College, NM College, and at HR College, I would have a lot of number of people here who would have gone to these colleges and had some interaction with me. Are there students here from my past colleges over here? Well, there are. I'm so happy to see, see this. And uh, I think the students make the teachers, so I have to thank the students for being the, such wonderful students that they have been. But I have to tell you this because I must share uh, why I didn't get into a business or I didn't join a corporate, and that was because when I finished my Master of Commerce in, at Sydenham College, that was among the first years when Sydenham College has started an MCOM in the day, and I was the first fellow of the MCOM. And that MCOM uh, made me teach my juniors. And can you imagine who, I must be their same age or a year older, I used to teach Rakesh Junjunwala, Uday Kotak, uh, and I used to have uh, all these young, Darab Davar, and all these young people in the class and you can imagine how difficult that situation was. There was no way that I was going to look at teaching in, in any way because these students uh, were much smarter than I was. So when I finished my Master of Commerce, I was told by Hindustan Leavers that they were only taking accepting MBAs till then, but they also wanted to look this year 
for an MCOM. So I applied to the Hindustan Leavers. At the same time, Principal Bal from Sydney College sent me an invitation to join Sydney College as the lecturer. So I had these, this job already in hand, and I went in for my Hindustan Leavers job. At that time, it was the most coveted multinational to be a part of. And there was a seven-tire interview system, three months of interviews. I had not studied for my MCOM as much as I studied for that interview. And I went through all the seven interviews. The last interview was just with the managing director to say whether I'm accepting the job or not. Just the day in the morning when I'm leaving to say yes to Hindustan leavers, and I'm at the door, my mother came to the door to say bye-bye to me, and she just whispered one sentence in my ear. And she said, the returns you will get from the smiles of the students will go far beyond the returns you will get from selling soap, detergent, and shampoo. And I didn't go for the final interview. I just sat downstairs in my building, and I didn't go, and I became a teacher. And now it's been over four decades of teaching, then I had the privilege of becoming the principal of HR College. For over 25 years, I've been a part of HR College, and I'm so happy to say that even today, HR College is the highest accredited in India with a 3.57, uh, 89 on, an, on a four. And the wonderful students that I have had there, but I think what's most important is that this whole journey of academics has been a passion. And I think one of the things about your own summit is passion and creativity which drive change. And I think for me too, passion and creativity has driven a lot of change. But we've done, so I think the most important thing then was that I think this is something we all know that India's future is shaped in her classrooms. And I think we have to do a number of things that we move from passion to compassion. While academics is very important, and I brought in a lot of academic rigor in most of the colleges. I introduced the Bachelor of Management Studies, the Accounting Finance, the Mass Media. We introduced a number of courses at the university. I was, I was a part of the University Board of Studies. And of course, I got appointed as the sheriff of Mumbai when I took delegations to different universities. We looked at internationalization. One of the things all through my career I have been very, 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 very passionate about is being compassionate. And the only education that I have really worked hard for is to see that every child in my college is sensitized to the fact that the people outside that classroom are not as privileged. If every student can just get that responsibility, that I have to be the responsible citizen, I'm the one who has to take that, the India forward. There are two Indias living back to back, and I'm sure the Japanese would know this, and India in the 18th century and India in the 21st century. It's the 21st century India which is sitting here, and my students and privilege who have to take the 18th century ahead. And we introduced, I made it mandatory. The, the, the degree came from the University of Mumbai, but I made it mandatory that I will not give you that degree till you have done one project in a, uh, you know, NGO. Everybody told me, oh, they'll give you fake certificates and so on. I said, it will touch one heart. That's enough for me. I just want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I was so happy when my students started Project Chirag. Project Chirag was something where they wanted to go out of the villages, and villages not too far away from Mumbai, which did not have light, and they introduced solar lantern. See how they did it.
So just wanted to tell you that today you'll be happy to know that more than 10,000 villages have been lit by these 18 and 19 year olds in all parts of India and it is all a student initiative. Let me tell you that while we were, we were doing these, there was one young man who was working with the dumb and the deaf. He was a young Kashmiri boy who had been sent from Jammu and Kashmir to study with us, but he did not because his father was attacked by terrorists and his mother brought him to me. He was here for five years, did excellently well in his examination, got picked up by Merrill Lynch, merit ranker, got picked up by Oxford Side Business School for an MBA scholarship, comes back and tells me, I don't want this Merrill Lynch job. And I said, why? Why? And he says, because it does not tug at my heart. What tugs at your heart? And he started, as I'll show you, the first of its kind, the first career company which employs only the dumb and the deaf. The first of its kind in the world. That's Miracle Careers. That's young Dhruv there. And I think you can look it up, M-I-R-K-L-E. And he has just got the President's Award for being the first youngest social entrepreneur in India. Having said this, having had this compassion, I think academics is very important. And as we can see, that it's important for us, as you are reimagining printing, we are reimagining education. This is India's state today. Higher education is growing. Unlike the printing business, which I don't know how much it is growing, but Indian higher education is growing. We have over 800 universities, we have over thousands of colleges, and we have a large number of people in our, enrolled in our higher education. But 50% of India's population, it's the youngest nation, the Japanese would know, you're the aging nation, we are the youngest nation. 50% of India's population is under the age of 25. And we have to find education for them. And they have to be globally competitive because the Japanese jobs will go to the Indians, right? The young Indians, right? So we recently had an entire Japanese executives come to us to understand India's aspirations to the youth because they want to do trade with the young and it's the young who are going to take this ahead. So this is what it is. If you can see this, this is one slide all of you must take home. India is going to be the only country in the world which is going to have a surplus in 2020, which is round the corner of 47 million human resources. Every other country, including UK, France, USA, please tell President Trump, why are you going against all these immigration laws? You're gonna have a shortfall of 17 million. You will need my Indians. Why are you doing this? Maybe we should tweet to him. He sees the Twitter of much faster. But that's where India is going to go. This is what it is, the only country in the world. But then are we giving them the right education? And I think that's more important. So we are today in the fourth industrial revolution, as we all know, right? And uh, these were this, you know, engineering, um, law, <coughs> medicine, accountancy, were the things that we used to be. Now it's moving towards design, innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship. Um, this is something that I felt that you are also as much affected as us, the printing organ. Every email says, think before you print. So I think it's time that you start thinking, and this is what it is. How's, how exciting is the future of printing? I thought I'll see that before I talk about the exciting. You're going to have, printing is going to become more eco-friendly. You're going to have <clears throat> 3D printing, which will change our lives, as, you, as I told you, how even the students are excited about it. And then the advanced technologies will bring printing to new heights. This is not something that I should be telling you. You all know about it. You should be telling me more. But 
There's entrepreneurship in printing. All of you are self-starters. Some of you have family businesses, and some of you have had some brilliant family businesses. Why are your young children not getting into your businesses? I think we have to motivate the young people to see different things in the same business. I found this video very interesting. It's a young girl who was in a three-generation business of printing and how she brought in a new life in her printing business. Here's a video. I think that chasing paper is at least a million dollar idea. You know, I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't think that that was possible. I've spent my 20s traveling, living in different cities, a lot of different apartments. Chasing paper came from me wanting to customize my own space. Removable wallpaper, you can put it up, take it down when you leave. It's easy to install, it's easy to take off. Kuba Nicholson is a large format printing company. They do things like billboards, bus shelters, all different kinds of things. My grandmother, she is 86 years old and is still the majority owner of the business, still signs checks and comes and walks the floor. And she's definitely an inspiration to me. I think that she's a huge part of why I love being entrepreneurial. National Geographic gave me, I think, more of the confidence to want to go out and travel and, and see things for myself. So I quit my job, I sold all my furniture, and I decided that I would backpack Asia for six months. My dad asked if I wanted to work for Kuba Nicholson. I spent a few months in Milwaukee. I walked the floor, I sat on each station on different machines, printing and shipping, every kind of job you could think of to really understand the business. I'd been doing a project for a friend. I created these wraps for these poles in her offices. Kind of started this idea that people might want to buy this. Young people can't necessarily afford art, but people want to customize their space. People don't need $120 worth of wallpaper sometimes. Sometimes people want a little bit. We sell in two foot by four foot panels. If you have just a small job that you need to spend $30 on or a large job that you're spending $300 on, you can do either and everything in between. We started with very little startup capital because we were manufacturing through Kuba Nicholson. Everything's printed on demand, so I have no inventory. So really, in starting, it was just building the website, which has very little startup cost. I'm just calling about the editorial shoot and what you guys need for samples. Pivoting can be difficult, especially when you're really small and you've been doing things a certain way, you know, the whole time you've been in business. I kind of wish that I had had been thinking about how it's going to look and, and live in a retail store from the beginning, but I haven't. I've gone into meetings where they're like, well, how is it going to be packaged? And I don't have answers to that yet. So there's definitely been some opportunities that I think I haven't been completely ready for just because I had these blinders on a little bit about just selling on my website. <coughs> So I think you've got the idea of how she has brought in. I think let's stop the video here and okay. let's go in next into. So this is entrepreneurship in printing. I think you have to encourage all your young people to use social media, to bring in technology, to think differently, but to grow your business. It's something that you will have to motivate. We in our own way at the educator's side are motivating all young people that they must first look at their family businesses and then see what they can do. 
Now let's see what's happening in the educational. What's the future of education today? Um, you, have, you have to have sustainable studies. Let's go quickly on to this. Um, applied artificial intelligence, machine and learning studies. What's the next? I, I don't know how many of you know AI and ML have become a must. I was in America recently sitting in a Starbucks at Union Square, New York, and there was an interview going on for a Starbucks young assistant store manager, and she was being asked if she had done any courses in AI and ML. Today, AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning are becoming the key. Your children, we teach them, and, and we, because we do design innovation and entrepreneurship and management, we teach them today Coding no longer is literature the new language. Coding is going to become your language. AI and ML are the future, and we teach them. And guess what else is the future? I'm going to introduce you to my companion, Teacher Alpha. This is my companion that I have just got. Thank you. So, this is Alpha. How many of you have seen Alpha? Anyone? No, because Alpha is my, my companion. Now, when I teach in a class, Alpha can actually program my whole lecture. And then I can leave Alpha behind in the class, and all those students who have missed my lecture can actually get Alpha to teach them. Today we are having the Vice Chancellor of the University of uh, the Deakin University, Australia, coming in. Who do you think is going to give her a tour of our campus? Alpha. Alpha gives tours to my students and parents of the campus. A third thing, the next time you invite me to give a guest speech, who do you think will come to give the guest speech? Alpha. Thank you. That's absolutely something which excites us because I think technology is most important. Now, engineering degrees are important, but our students, like if my young student could tell me, and I had to ask him, what's, what's invisible photonic ink? And he knew it, an 18-year-old, but I didn't. So this is what it is. How do we keep in, in touch with all of them? So this is it. Uh, the time for change is now for us in the education. You have to change your printing processes. I have to change my curriculum. I have to change the way I teach. Alpha teaches and students attend his class much more than they attend my class, right? So we have to think of new technologies and we have to think of how, yes, I taught in Sydney College and yes, I was being taught in Sydney College, 19th century faculty 19th century curriculum taught by 28th century um, faculty today in 21st century. We are all the time bringing our past to the future. We should be bringing our present to the future. And I think, so the challenge is three new schools that I started. You'll only hear of Indian education very siloed. You have either a School of uh, Commerce, Arts, and uh, Engineering. If you have law, these are, of course, very important, important silos and important verticals. But I think what we need to do is now to have interdisciplinary. And universities, why are the U US universities so ahead of us? Because it's interdisciplinary. How do you make it inter interdisciplinary? How do you do this? It was a big challenge for me. I was a traditional, conventional faculty member and principal of a commerce college with the University of Mumbai. Sitting there, I got this offer, start a school of design. I knew nothing about design. And all that one statement changed my mind, that every design may not make business sense, but going ahead, every business will have to make design sense. Apple today has changed the world. 
You don't need an office. I have an office in my handbag because I have my iPhone. I can do everything from there. I don't need to be present in my office. The same way, it's going to change the classrooms. Why do I, then my next class is going to be in Starbucks because I need a coffee after this lecture. So come there and we'll have a session there. Why are we confining ourselves to conventions? So the design school. So we started the design school. As you can see, we joined hands with Parsons. Parsons is the leading school in the US. I actually went around to, the, to NID and I went and said, help me. But they said, we are too regulated. I said, we want to be an autonomous school. And so Parsons, 150 years old, is joined hands with us. They help us with the curriculum, faculty development, and they do quality oversight. The second school, this is very interesting. I was on a flight and I meet the head of WPP. Do you know there are 63 companies? I think printing, printers, all should know Ogilvy, JW, Group M, all these are companies of WPP. And today the owner is, the head is uh, Martin Sorel. I met him in a flight, I was sitting next to him and he took my card and he says, Dean of a college, you are to blame. And I said, for what? He says, you know, I have 63 companies. I need 15,000 young people every year. I cannot find talent in your country. I said, why? And he said, because your education system does not train them to be work ready. And it's so true. Because what we teach them is so different from what they actually go into the real life. And I said, Mr. Sorel, we can improve this situation. And he said, 1.2 billion in your country, train them. And I said, we can improve the situation, let's join hands. And we started, that's Martin Sorel, we started the School of Communication. Today, we are the first of its work study kind of school. Students study anywhere they want, but in the afternoon, they come to us and we do a work study. Internships, live projects, everything associated with be becoming ready for the real world of work. And then, of course, having the background of management, I said, let's start a school of management. But every day, my husband, who works, who heads the pharmaceutical industry, tells me 23 million babies are being born every year. Less than 1 million jobs are being created. You are creating lawyers, accountants, managers at HR College. Where are the jobs of the future? Create entrepreneurs. And so we have become the first school of entrepreneurship which was inaugurated by the chief minister. So three schools, very different schools. Very interesting uh, assignment for me. I would just say that I have to thank, I know I, I think there's something gone wrong with the clock. I know, know by my time that I've finished my 45 minutes, I would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to my schools, come and see how differently we've created the schools. Our schools have 30% of our curriculum is based on compassion. They have to work projects outside of the school with those who are less privileged. Some are working with the Cancer Society, some are working with the municipal schools, some are doing different things, working with road safety, anything, but they have to work for the country. They have to give back. That is the best education we can. They can learn math. Even my alpha can teach them marketing that I teach in the class, but they will never be able to learn the right values and the responsibility unless they go into the real world. And let me tell you, our latest program that we have just introduced, yesterday we got an email from Wharton to say that they are sending three top faculty to observe our program. What is that program? Students have to do 10 hours where? We've always talked about the rich adopting the poor. We've reversed everything, we've disrupted education. Let the poor adopt 
rich. And so, for these 10 hours, what happens? 10 hours, a student of mine who goes after a lot of interviews, screening from us, the right student, goes, has to be adopted by a slum dweller for 10 hours at a stretch. We have got counselors, school counselors, who will go with them. We have checked out the families. We are working with a slum. And in each of those, for 10 hours, the students have to be there. Two students have just finished their assignment. One of them, when he went into the slums had to just help out the, uh, the, the lady there, and she, she had an older mother-in-law and two little children. The older, older mother-in-law started having an asthma attack. He had to find a hospital. He had to take her to that government hospital. He had to get her admitted to that hospital. And then he had to come back because the young lady had to go to meet her mother-in-law and be there. So he had to look after two little children. Let me tell you, the children are survived. The, the, the 10 hours have gone through. And you know what is the first thing he came back and he told me? He said, ma'am, I cannot believe that there can be a world like this outside our homes. World that is so deprived. How can we be living? This is one day. And he says, every time a child cries, he's now sensitive to that child. Because he knows he had to put up with two children. If I have given that education to these students, I think I've done the best. And ladies and gentlemen, just want to end with a video which shows our facilities, our, our school, new schools. I would take this opportunity to ask the president that we would like to host you. If you want to have a program, Freddie, if you want to do anything there, we have now two incubators. We are incubating entrepreneurs. We are in incubating fintech operators. Please come over and see our facilities. Be a part of it. It's at One India Bull Center, and it's 750,000 square feet for all these three schools. I'm really privileged because in, in, in HR College, I had 18,000 square feet for 7,000 students. I still produced great results. I hope 750,000 uh, uh, square feet will produce the leaders that India needs. Let's have a look at the video. Our philosophy is based on DICE, which stands for Design, Innovation, Creativity, and Entrepreneurship, which I believe will be the key skills for economic growth for a new India and will catalyze job creation, the urgent need for our nation. I am glad to know that all the three institutions the Indian School of Design and Innovation, ISD, WPP School of Communication, and the Indian School of Management and Entrepreneurship are leading the way in redefining the delivery of higher education through the DICE ecosystem. I not imagine what they are trying to explain. And I do agree now that unless you see it, you won't really be able to figure out when you talk of all the good things that you've been doing, uh, seeing is believing very clearly and it's been a very, very exciting journey through the ISME and the School of Design and Innovation. And truly what you've created here is what this country needs, something very new, something which is very relevant to today's times. I would compliment you here for being actually way ahead of us. In, in the way that you're thinking about education. We've had several students from the Indian School of Design and Innovation successfully transfer to our campus in New York City. This is the third time that I've traveled to India and each time um, I've been able to visit ISD and their wonderful hosts and getting to meet their wonderful students is really an amazing opportunity for me. They're truly doing really great things here and getting to experience a kind of education that's really unique to India. If you're looking for a career in advertising, if you're passionate about creativity and consumers. If you really want to get the best of a theoretical knowledge and real practical sense. STWPT is the place for you to be in.
So, you know, when I hear about what ISBI is doing here, it seems like this idea should have happened so long ago. It's a perfectly placed program in the sense that the skills and the level of education that is conducted here is exactly what the students need. A great concept whose timing is perfect. Excited by by what I've seen here at ISME because um, of the kind of core principles that um, that ISME uh, are absolutely um, enthralled in. So passion being one, inquisitiveness being the other, uh, and also innovation being the third. And and these can be seen uh, as an integral part of everything that that ISME does. So uh, for instance, flexibility in their uh, in the, in the timetabling. Uh, inclusion of value-added lectures, um, opportunities to engage with with 109 corporates in the same building. You know, this is really, really exciting stuff. spaces, the collaborative workspaces, there's so much of thought that's gone behind planning for all of you all to become better learners uh, uh, and at some stage better mentors and better teachers to others as you go forward. We have suggested me one disruption of creating a university like this and I assure you that I am very soon looking to it, we have shown me a new way so we will find a dispensation by which such institutions can be translated and transformed into universities. Thank you so much. Um, this, is, this is what it is. We need all your blessings because we need good wishes. We are about to become a university and I think it will be a, the first innovation hub in uh, uh, the urban innovation hub in Mumbai and I think I would like to welcome you for this. We have disrupted education in, in an innovative way, just like all of you are disrupting the printing business. So I think we need this good luck. It's been just the change of a mindset from being the conventional education to a very innovative, dynamic model. And I'd just like to say, that there's one thing which my mother used to always tell me, and I'm going to share this with you. Soch badlo, to sitare badal jayenge. Nazar badlo, to nazare badal jayenge. Kyu roch kishtiyan badalte ho. Dishayen badlo, to kinare badal jayenge. Thank you.